Welcome to Innovative in Education Lecture 13. My name is Mike Evans. This is Innovative in Education Organic. So in this lecture we'll be talking about stereochemistry of cyclohexanes as well as the bulk of the lecture will be devoted to an introduction to reactivity. So let's go ahead and jump right in here. So you'll recall from last time that we looked at the chemistry of cyclohexane. Cyclohexane is an interesting cycloalkane because it's essentially strain free. Although we would expect cyclohexane to have a little bit of angle strain based on its angles, its bond angles in a two-dimensional view, which just show it as kind of a hexagon as you see here, really in three dimensions it possesses this kind of puckered structure where the bonds sort of pucker up and one end bends one way, the other end bends the other way, and the result is an essentially strain-free molecule. In other words, the energy of cyclohexane is essentially equivalent to the energy of its open chain analog hexane. Interestingly, this three-dimensional shape gives cyclohexane some interesting properties. So it, you'll see from this diagram here that cyclohexane can exhibit two forms, two diastereomeric forms that differ in their conformational properties. So in the left-hand form, this substituent is pointing sort of outward with respect to the ring. We call that substituent equatorial. And here we see the substituent pointing straight up and down, nearly perpendicular to sort of the pseudo-plane formed by the ring. We call that guy axial. And we talked about how equatorial substituents are more stable than axial, and all the various conformational dynamics in terms of how those chair forms interconvert and the like. Today what we're going to look at is the stereochemistry of cyclohexanes. So cyclohexane stereochemistry is kind of interesting because substitution patterns around a cyclohexane ring can actually, whoops, can actually illustrate many of the principles we've talked about in terms of stereoisomerism. So first question I wanted to pose to you is whether or not the molecule we're looking at here is chiral. Remember that our condition of chirality was looking for a plane of symmetry in the molecule. If we found a plane of symmetry, we knew that the molecule was achiral. That is, it was identical with its mirror image. On the other hand, if we didn't find a plane of symmetry, we knew that the molecule was chiral. Likewise with an inversion center. If we found an inversion center, we knew that the molecule was achiral. On the other hand, if we couldn't find one, we knew the molecule was chiral. And looking at the molecule there that you see, this tert butyl cyclohexanol, we see that there's no plane of symmetry in this molecule. A plane of symmetry or a plane that interconverts the two sides of the cyclohexane ring will not interconvert the hydroxyl and the tert butyl and maintain the symmetry of the molecule. So, in other words, there's no plane of symmetry in this molecule, and no matter how hard you try, you can't bend it or stretch it somehow to achieve a plane of symmetry within it. Now, based on this idea, the enantiomer of that molecule should be um, chiral as well. So in other words, this molecule and its enantiomer should differ in their structure. And indeed, if you look down here, the relationship between these two molecules, they are in fact enantiomeric. So looking at these as non-superimposable mirror images, we should be able to, first of all, align them so that they look like mirror images. And we could do that by sort of turning this molecule over and bringing it a little bit, a little bit down and, and over. So translating and rotating that around, those molecules would look like mirror images. And then, of course, the next big question is whether the molecules are superimposable or not. And they should not be superimposable if they're they are enantiomers. So in looking at this, let's take the right-hand molecule and try to superimpose it on the left-hand molecule. So we can clearly rotate around and get the OH group to line up. And now going around, we can then go this way. And we see continuing that way it will actually lead to a tert butyl group on this position in the right-hand molecule. 
so we can get the entire ring to line up. The only thing that doesn't match is the position of the tert butyl group. So in the left-hand molecule, we see it's to the left of the hydroxyl, but in the right-hand molecule, it's off to the right. And just as we've seen before with a variety of examples of enantiomers, the two molecules are non-superimposable. So based on this analysis, we see that these are non-superimposable mirror images. Therefore, they are enantiomers by definition. And they would exhibit all the various properties of enantiomers in terms of um, having opposite optical activity and interacting with other chiral molecules in different ways. Now, it's a legitimate question to ask, what's the relationship between the chair flipped forms of these molecules? And that's an interesting question because in thinking about the conformational dynamics, we might ask, do the two conformations behave differently? Would we expect them to behave differently um, from each other? So if we flip one of the molecules, let's take this starting molecule here and just chair flip it. If we do that, the result is a compound that looks like this. The hydroxyl, which was down and um, Axial is now down and equatorial, like so, and the tert butyl, which was down and axial, is now down, uh, down and equatorial, excuse me, is now down and axial. All right, so there is the chair flipped form of the molecule on the left here. Now ask yourself, what's the relationship between those two? Well, we could turn the ring around and match up the rings, the two rings with each other but then the substituents would not match. So if we did that, then the tert butyl group would be up here pointing axially. The OH would be pointing equatorially here if we did that. So even if we got the ring to match up, we couldn't get the substituents to match. And beyond that, these two are not mirror images of one another. Thus, because they're non-superimposable, and they're not mirror images of one another, we know that those two molecules must be diastereomers. Now think back to our discussion of the energies of, stereo of, uh, of stereoisomers. Remember that we said that diastereomers have different energies and different chemical behavior. So interestingly, we would expect these two molecules to behave very differently for instance, in a dehydration reaction. We might expect one diastereomer to go faster than the other, and we might have good chemical reasons for that, but the key is the difference in shape and the different internal dimensions between these two diastereomers. The thing that distinguishes these and that makes them unique and somewhat interesting is that they're interconvertible by a conformational process, this process of the chair flip. As a result, we would call these conformational diastereomers. So this is the first example we'll see of that, and we'll see some a little bit later on um, in the course as we start to talk about reactivity for sure.